You're very welcome to the Keith Andrews Show. As ever, it's available on OffTheBall.com in terms of YouTube, Twitter, Facebook. Joining us this week is Mr. Owen Sheen. Owen, overtime for you today? Yeah, right. golden ticket winner is what you describe me as. Uh, that's what you describe all your guests as, uh, apparently. And how did you apply for this? Uh, well, I applied when this studio was being constructed a long, long time ago. It was one of my first ports of call when I started working <laughs> for this organisation. was apply for the Keith Andrews <laughs> Show, and one day you might be successful. So here I am. I'm delighted to be here. Good. I'm glad you joined us. Um, right, we have to start this week with Wes Hulan. Landed quite nicely. Wake up this morning. Bang. There it is. Wes Hulan Matoras. Probably one of a few which we anticipate are certainly in that bracket, Daryl Murphy, a couple of weeks ago, announced his retirement. There's people like Glenn Whelan, John O'Shea, John Walters. It depends how far you want to get on in terms of age groups, Aidan McGeady. Um, were you surprised? Not surprised at all. Of course, though, when you pick up the paper this morning, you're like, oh, wow, well, okay, it's, it's just happened. Like, you look at him at the age of 35, and if he went for another two years, which he would have had to do if he continued to go on, he would have been one of the oldest, oldest international yeah. players that have ever played for Ireland. So now is the time to call it. But it's just this feeling of regret, isn't it, at the end of the day? I mean, you would have seen both sides of it, mm. seeing it from the inside, and I'm not sure, was there a sense of frustration from your side of things under Trapattoni as to the lack of Wes in the team? But certainly when you moved to the outside looking in, you very much appreciated how frustrated people were with Wes. Uh, and even, like, it was, it was Aidan Fitzmaurice who broke it in the Herald today, and, like, he just, the one stat from his piece that really sticks out to me today was that he obviously has 43 caps, but since he got his first cap, uh, Ireland have played 110 games, which is, uh, like, that is incredible. That is the stat that sums up Wes Hulin's Ireland career. Yeah, well, he was he was in a squad with Don Givens Ball all the way back in 2002. Didn't get on um, when Don was caretaker manager. Gets his cap in 2008. Um, so I, I actually see some similarities between our careers in terms of getting the opportunity very late. Um Look, I would have grievances that I didn't maybe get caps before I, I did, maybe in my in my early 20s when I was playing regularly at championship level. I was captain of Wolves. I felt I should have been in and around it. That didn't happen. Uh, I had to wait until I was 28 for my first cap. Wes, very, very similar. You know, it's, it's too easy at times just to say he should have had a lot more caps. And I know in terms of that period, that's fine. But in terms of his club career, your club career dictates to a degree how well you do at international level and get you on that pedestal. So when he was in playing the League of Ireland, when he was playing at Livingston, probably didn't warrant international caps in my opinion because of the level that he's playing at isn't good enough. That's a, I think that's a fair comment. Yeah. I, I think there's an element of the championship with this as well. Um, like maybe people view it and the player in the championship is better than the player in the Premier League, but they will go, mm. the manager will go on you know, club experience. And they, they buy into that a little bit too much potentially. And I think people realise now what what a division the championship really is yeah. and the competitiveness of it all. But like you start to wonder, was Wes Houlihan tarred by his League of Ireland brush? Like I I don't want to kind of override the disdain that some people have had for the League of Ireland, but it, so he's playing in the League of Ireland, goes to the UK, and at that point then, how well do you have to play to actually outstrip mm -hmm. the notion that, oh, you were only good enough for the League of Ireland only a couple of years ago. Because I, I get a sense of that with the likes of Sean Maguire now, yeah. that Sean e. Maguire doesn't get the respect he deserves, but he would have been getting it had he come up through an academy system and played with that Preston North End team now. So I think there's a, an element of that, certainly, with, with Wes's career in that regard. Well, I, I, I wasn't in Ireland when Wes was playing four shells and getting a lot of profile and, uh, and that's how he got the move to England but I have been here to see some of Sean Maguire's development and we spoke about this I think it was last week or the week before in terms of what I've seen in the League of Ireland in the last year to two the only player that I would have picked to go into an Ireland squad would have been Sean Maguire now I can't comment in terms of what Wes was doing at that time whether it was of similar type of levels mm -hmm. because I looked at Sean Maguire and I just seen a player playing in the playground he was far and above everything else that he was playing with and against in the League of Ireland. I don't know about Wes. Yeah, well, I think you've got goals with Sean Maguire. So there's a metric there straight away. It's like this guy is breaking all yeah. goal scoring records. Cork City are breaking loads of records as well. They're outstripping this unbelievable Dundalk team that everybody was watching yeah. in Europe. So suddenly that, that cocktail of things with Sean Maguire elevates him up to a level on a par with Championship. And that's why we had this real clamour to get Maguire in there when he was playing for Cork City. Let's not, let's not forget as well where Wes was coming through in and around that. I think he went to Livingston 2006. Got the got the move to Blackpool onto Norwich. So before that, 
we were very much in an era where it wasn't Barcelona type players. We've come onto this in the last, say, 10 years ish, where diminutive players aren't pushed to one size. You know, size wasn't the be all and end all. And certainly, the position he played when he was coming through and trying to forge a career, it was a 4 4 2 system. There was no number 10s. You played with two strikers. Now, that went against him in terms of his Ireland chances, certainly under Mr. Trapattoni, for obvious reasons, which I played in. Uh, we wanted Wes in the squad, no doubt about it. He you wanted him in the team? Yeah. Wanted a different change of system, especially when you're playing against the better nations where you are crying out for an additional midfielder and a player with his qualities and attributes on the ball. There's a misconception, in my opinion, about Wes in terms of that he's a luxury. I think in the last year to two, maybe at times playing a 90-minute game because of his age, he's, he can be seen as a luxury, but not in terms of the type of player he is. So if you look at Wes, age 28 to 32, say, he should have been in the team more often than not because his work rate off the ball, his cuteness, his cleverness and how he wins the ball back, how he triggers the angle of approach, he instigates the press. If you look at him for club teams, Norwich in the, in the main. He's the trigger. Yeah, he's the trigger. And the amount of times he, he forces the opposition down one side, doesn't cheaply let them come back the other way and then your whole team shape changes behind that or he actually wins the ball high up and then he has that vision to go and play the killer pass. Yeah, it strikes me as well that, even just from his interviews and stuff, and I hate to use this word because it's such a cliche, but the honesty from Wes Hulhan, and just I bring that up because of what you mentioned there, in terms of a pressing game, I'd imagine if there's anybody who can do it, he can do it, but also, if there's a man who can apply himself to the pressing game, it is Wes Hulhan. If he's going to press, he's going to press well. He's going to be like Roberto Firmino without the yeah. ball. You know, He's going to do the job correctly. And I think the two, the two strikers thing is a very good point. And I think you can, to a certain extent, hold that up and be like, fair enough with Trap. They, he had his way of playing, mm -hmm. and with the two strikers up front, there was no way Trap was going to risk a player like him. And maybe under Trap, you could refer to him as a luxury. Under Martin O'Neill, I, I think referring to him as a luxury is not a viable excuse. I think referring to him as, as an older player who maybe wasn't able to last 90 minutes, maybe that's fair enough. Yeah. I mean, he played, what was it, five and a half games out of Ireland's 12 games in total, if you, if you add up all his minutes uh, in the last qualification campaign. That's a pretty poor return yeah, from somebody. He was used sparingly, wasn't he? But Martin often, sparingly. often would change and go with a narrow four or he would want John Walters on the right going back a couple of years and, and, and you know, to, to tweak the team. So it depended on the, the shape of the team, obviously, whereas Wes had to play in a 4-3-3. He couldn't play any of the wide positions because he would get done by modern-style fullbacks being able to go and go where he wouldn't be able to keep up with that. But in the hustle and bustle of central midfield in that advanced area, he should have got more minutes. There's no doubt about it. He should have got more minutes. What I do think went against him, more so under the trap reign than Martins, but I do think it played a little bit of an influence. The public clamour, media, pundits, constantly being asked about Wes, and it, it was probably the same going back with Andy Reid on the Trapattoni and Stephen Ireland. It went against them, because the whole country gets behind it, gets a little bit of a bit between the teeth, and they just push and probe, certainly on the trap one there. I'm not so sure how much it went against him with Marin, but I do do think a little bit maybe. Was and like does that sort of stuff actually pervade the environment that you're in under trap? Because I don't know, Trap does strike me as a particularly arrogant man. Uh, he, he struck me as somebody who will say pretty honestly what he thought of people's abilities. And I would say that the last thing uh, Giovanni Trapattoni wants to be told is what the public think yeah. and of what he should be doing because I'm Giovanni Trapattoni he will say what and do you know? yeah precisely yeah. and I think that there was a certain element of that with uh, Wes Hulhan but maybe maybe there wasn't I'm not sure like because would he, he wouldn't have been I suppose in direct competition with yourself no but there is an element where your game might have been improved in the green shirt had you had Wes as a middleman between you and the strikers You're crying out for it absolutely crying out for it none more so than Euro 2012 when we were playing against Spain or Italy when especially against Spain it was like you were in a a nest of bees or wasps there was that many players flowing around you and we we're stuck in a four man midfield getting overrun as per usual against the better opposition whereas someone like Wes I think it was his third cap was my last cap which was late November uh, yeah November 2012 against Greece Wes came on I think it was half time 
I came on as a sub quite early because Glenn Whelan got injured and straight away that extra man, that bounce pass into midfield, the ability to find them in those little spaces, it just makes your life so much easier, it really does. Even, so say, for example, so in that game, Whelan's off the pitch, you're on with Houlihan, so even in the absence of Glenn Whelan, it's easier to play because you've got Wes there, it's nothing to do with, the protection of Whelan is essentially a moot point then. Yeah, well, it, to, to get Wes in the team, he has to play as the out-and-out -out number 10. There's different ways, obviously, you can manipulate the midfield, whereas now we have, say, a, a midfield of one sitter and two leg-type ones in midfield, which works so well against Italy in the Euros. Whereas, I can't remember, it was, it was James McCarthy, maybe, um, who started that game. I came on for Glenn, so it would be maybe myself and James McCarthy. I can't entirely remember. And Wes ahead of that. Mm. Um, and Glenn Whelan, who is someone who gets a ridiculous amount of criticism unwarranted and again the other way so in terms of the public clamor for Wes and putting him on a pedestal and which I agree to to a degree I think he's a very talented player but I don't just go along with it because it's two ends of the spectrum really wasn't it yeah. and Glenn Whelan very different type of player you can't play with three Wes Hulans in midfield you need people like a Glenn Whelan you need people like me and a team to let those players those flair players so for instance could you have imagined a team back then of Myself, Glenn, James, whoever it was in the two midfield positions, um, with Wes ahead of it, Damien Duff one side, uh, Robbie Keane as the focal point, that forces you to play a certain way. You yeah. cannot play direct because you have to find those players with quality in the final third of the pitch. So it changed the whole <coughs> sway of the team. But obviously, it depends on what way your manager wants to set you up. Yeah, it makes you think, just even about the recent campaign and think about the potential of Arthur and McCarthy maybe or Myler in those two positions you mentioned there with Hulahan just ahead of them. I know Walters was missing for a long time from that but you'd have McLean on, on one wing, um, whoever it may have been, Shane Long or uh, Daryl Murphy up front and then wh whoever was fit on, on the right wing. Like That certainly seemed to me to be mm -hmm. a team that a lot of people were saying this is one we should be going with and the only reason people were saying that was because they had Wes Hulahan right there in that number 10 position which I don't think there was any question was his best role, is his best role, and we're still going to see probably a couple of more unbelievable goals with Norwich before his career is out. And it, it is just a feeling of regret. It's like, I, and I don't know why I'm Say that, regret. you say that, but I go back to some of the points I was making earlier in terms of his club career dictating how, how much of an opportunity he gets. He couldn't realistically be thinking he should be getting caps up until probably the age of 26, 27 maybe in the round, Blackpool, yeah. season-long loan star, but then he signed in a permanent. But it was mainly Norwich when he really catapulted himself. And it's his second season at Norwich, I think it was, where he scored a lot more goals and came to prominence. Well, so That's when they get promoted in the first yeah, season and then second season in the Premier League. Yeah. That, yeah, that is when he comes into the public consciousness. And then you're thinking, yeah, fair enough. And then it depends very much on the manager who's in charge, obviously the last two being Mr. Trapattoni and Martin O'Neill. What system does he fit into it? Doesn't fit in under Giovanni Trapattoni. He was reluctant to play anything else but a four-four-two, compact and quite direct. Yeah, defensive, defensively orientated, defence first. Anything else was a bonus. Relying the magic of Damien Duff, relying the magic and goal-scoring ability of Robbie Keane. That was it, really. Yeah, but under Martin, slightly different. Martin was willing to tweak tactics, shape of the team. So his opportunities were more. And he did. He got more, a lot more caps, obviously, and the majority of his caps on, on the Martin. He was the third most used player on the Martin's reign, wasn't he? But in terms of minutes played, I know you've already mentioned, he will be frustrated. But mm. in his statement this morning, he has it. He's been very grateful. And he could have stayed on and probably got past 50 caps used in that sparing fashion. But he feels content, I think. Maybe. I, I do think with international football, the stakes are higher. So you don't have another game next week to make up the three points or whatever in a, whatever, a 38 game season. So I think managers are less willing to take a risk. And with a team like Ireland, that hampers Wes Houlihan's chances of starting any games. But the thing on his club career is what I think is, look at where his position. He wants to play in a club where he is the best player in the number 10 role. Mm. Or at, at, at this current moment, he's not maybe the best number 10 at Norwich, but he'll certainly play a lot around there. Yeah. And uh, like just in terms of playing minutes. But say to take uh, peak Wes Houlihan. Him. He wants to play at number 10 and start for a number 10 for any club. And you're going down through the 20 best number 10s in English football before you get to the championship. That's only 20 players and club mm -hmm. football is far far superior to international football at the moment, particularly when it comes to the Premier League and the money involved. So 
I don't think the whole kind of, oh, he's not even starting for a championship team stick, was, it, was, was a fair thing to, to beat him. Yes. No, I, I agree with that. I and mean, we've got a season ticket holder I've been on from uh, Norwich City, Niall Murphy. Um, Wes is the best player I ever watched. Absolute disgrace that he only got 43 caps. Same score at the Euros was a magical day. I was there at that stadium. Day off, very good day, very good night. Um, <laughs> but look, this is the affection that people have for Wes and why there has been such a clamour because he is very different to generally what we produce. I think we will see a difference in the next 10 to 15 years with the coaching that has gone on and is going on at underage in terms of the way they're produced. You know, Wes was very, very different. He was a, he was a magical player. He could improvise. And still is. Yeah. He was clever. He was cute. And I don't. I keep going back to that point about, and I've said this time and time again, he doesn't get the credit he deserves for what he does off the ball and how hard he works. He really doesn't. And that's probably something that annoys me a little bit. The fact that he has been seen as a luxury type player. I wonder is the off the ball work that some of the Ireland players do, is that really conducive to an Irish system? As in the high pressing, the winning the ball back, counter attacking, mm. as in it has been more of a sit deep, kind of wait and see, patient sort of game. And without the ball then, I wonder does Wes Hoolan, is he a little bit defunct? Yeah, he's, it's, it's, it's a, it is a conundrum because he's, he is, he's probably one of the most clever and intelligent players I've played with in terms of the positions he picks up. Um, and I keep going back to him in terms of that style. When you play with him, your whole team just changes. Because if I go back to when he first came in, in that uh, Greece game in November 2012, we'd have had a midfielder. I've already mentioned Glenn Whelan, James McCarthy. Can't remember who else was in the squad, maybe a Darren Gibson. You've got similar-ish type players, all with different attributes, but they're sent them midfielders. Whereas Wes is just totally different and even what's available now or what's been available in the last couple of years you've mentioned Harry Arthur you've got Brady Hendrick all different players we've got no one else like Wes Hulan. we really don't mm. and on that note we've had another um, tweet in off Savo uh, has anyone checked on Eamon Dunphy this morning to make sure he's okay so we know Eamon's been a big fan of his look I want to move on um, overall been a great servant to Ireland Special, special player, and he's held very, very dearly amongst Ireland fans. I'm even going to miss the, just the potential of him coming off the bench. And, you know, quite often he was never used or was used too sparingly. But still, at least I had that moment of excitement when he was in the squad. Now it's gone. Yeah, you know, it, it was always <laughs> the, the chance. It was always the hope, and it kills you, doesn't it? Um, I want to move on to, first we'll tell you what's coming up in the show. We've got a bit of um, Gerald Bryan at the end of the show coming up. Steve McLaren, before that, we're going to talk to him about Conte. Uh, Arsene Wenger, England days, etc. Um, please get in touch. If you've got any comments you want us to get stuck into, it, we will try our best. If not, we will get into them maybe next week. Um, right, on to Conte and Chelsea. Keeps lingering, keeps going on. Um, shouldn't really be surprised in terms of it's Chelsea Football Club. It's kind of the way they work things. But he, over the last few weeks, especially during those last two games, Bournemouth 3 at home, Watford 4-1 four, four away, he looks a very frustrated figure and it wouldn't really have surprised any of us, I suppose, if it just came up this week that Conte's left That's it. Ancelotti's in till the end of the season or there's talk of Luis Enrique, Sarri at Napoli, uh, maybe more long-term options. Um, but for once, they haven't hit that button. But They're going to hit it soon. They are, aren't they? And I think he's accelerated the process of this happening that... Okay, so a Premier League win at Chelsea, you never know how long it's going to buy you. I think mm. Jose Mourinho is the quickest one to be sacked after a Premier League win seven months, uh, what, two seasons ago or whatever. Uh, so Conte's already kind of outdone that. But he has accelerated with what happened last year with that link to Inter Milan. And he goes to, the, I'm not sure did he actually go to Milan, but certainly he was on the phone to somebody in the San Siro. There was a juicy five-year contract for him waiting at Inter. And he kind of used that as a bargaining yeah. chip with Roman Abramovich. You do not do that to Roman Abramovich. You do not call the shots when it comes to your con contractual things. You take what you're given and invariably it's a lot of money. You can hard bargain you want mm. with Roman, but don't go off and try and hardball him with somebody else. The stock was well and truly risen. He came in and took the Premier League by storm. <coughs> yeah. The, the, the manner they played, the system that they played with, so different. Now we've had teams in the last 12 months trying to copy it, trying to emulate it, trying to cancel it out when they play it, playing that three at the back going toe to toe. The personnel, even last season, I played with Marcus Alonso at Bolton Wanderers. If you'd have told me he was going to win the Premier League, I would have had my underpants. I swear to God. 
No chance. Absolutely no chance. Didn't see it. Victor Moses, right wing back. Yeah. Do me a favour. Do me a favour. So the way he got them going and what he did last year deserves so much, so much credit. And he got it. And then maybe he's just had that little bit of step up and thought he's managing at a normal club. Yeah. And he's not. Chelsea is like the most unnormal club you could possibly imagine. It, it is just strange. It's it's borderline schizophrenic. Some of the stuff that occurs in in that club, like it's absolutely bizarre. Like you look at some of the players now, and I think Gary Cahill and Fairness Tim has been honest enough about it. He's like, we we didn't step up at all. We weren't good enough, and that was after the Watford game. But I've got a big problem with owners making signings because where are the players' loyalties if they've been signed by Roman Abramovich? Mm-hmm. If they see things in the media that Abramovich isn't happy with Conte or Conte's gone off to chat to other clubs. They kind of feel knifed by Conte a little bit because he's got to, to speak to Inter Milan. Their loyalty is to the very top and not to Conte. So that might even split the camp as well because some of them are clearly Conte players. Like I'd imagine the likes of Moses and uh, Alonso are very thankful yeah. to Conte for turning their careers around essentially last year. But it's some a, of them... It's a continental model though and he knows what he's stepping into when he enter, enters Stamford Bridge or into his common training ground. But he has done ridiculously well. But this season just hasn't looked... The same type, and you've mentioned about who signings. It, it could be interesting to get Steve McLaren's take on that. He would have had issues with hierarchy at football clubs, but they were after Ed and Zeko, couldn't get him because of the length of contract. That's a club decision. Yeah, it's a poor one. He wanted it? a two and a half year deal. They were only willing to give him eighteen months because, and they got Olivier Giroud on an eighteen month deal, probably knowing that Conte is going to leave in the coming weeks, end of the season. And then they've only got a year left, rather than a player left 32 years of age or whatever they would have been with two years left on the contract. Where are they going to go? They're not going to go anywhere else. So it's a tricky situation, but it's run in a continental fashion. Watford are running the exact same way. The manager, and you see quite often now, manager's been appointed as the head coach. Different terminology, just coach the team. There's your players. But Conte coming from Italy should have been used to that. Yeah, I suppose you're right. The Watford model is a very interesting one to point out because they're definitely the most frequent club at just turning over a manager and it seems that the managers are completely fine with that bar, um, bar, bar the, pre, the, the latest sacking after the Everton kind of uh, interest mm. in, in the club like that was just a bizarre moment but other than that like you go back to the, the managers like Jovanovic even or Jokanovic rather the fella who is managing Fulham I think at the moment when he got them promoted yeah, in the first place uh, to the Premier League there was kind of a, a dispute with the club and suddenly he's out the door mm. and they just don't have any loyalty to the manager and that's fine as long as you're consistent about it and to a certain extent I do believe Abramovich is consistent about it and Conte would have been given a little bit more patience because he's going to get sacked in the next couple of weeks. I'm absolutely convinced of it. He w- I think he would have got to the, uh, till the end of the season on this form had he not gone off and talked to another club last summer. I think Abramovich feels that the counter-loyalty that should always be there from the bottom up hasn't existed uh, with the, the Conte situation. So he hasn't done himself any favours there. But Antonio Conte is going to be completely fine. Wherever he goes, he's going to succeed. Yeah. Probably back to Syria. Well, it'll be very interesting to see where he ends up and obviously how he gets on if he's still there with Barcelona. Okay, we're going to move on. I'm delighted to say former England manager Steve McLaren joins just back from Israel in a coaching consultancy role at Maccabee Tel Aviv. Um, I've spent a little bit of time with him lately at games and he is itching to get back into football. I think it's in the blood. I think, you know, I've, I've tried. I've had spells uh, out of the game and, you know, if you yourself finishing playing, going into TV, if you ever go into coaching, you want to do that, managing, it's very much uh, an up and down world, uh, very much more downs than ups, as you know, as a player, but as a manager, they're, 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 um, you know, it, it's ballooned out of all expectation. But it's kind of having a team, you know, involved when you're playing and you're playing with a team. It's that camaraderie, it's that uh, crossing the white line, it's that bond that you get together. And that's similar to a manager. It's it's about having a team, building a team, developing a team, developing individual players. And and that was from 31 years old when I when I you know just happened to to be given an opportunity to coach the youth team and reserve teams at Oxford. Wanted to do. Um, I've looked at other things, sports directorship, uh, you know, punditry and things like that, but. I'm a coach. Um, I'm fascinated by the game. I love the game. Um, win or lose or draw, you know, I'm frustrated. It can get back on the bike, win this game, uh, develop his work tactics. And I think the game is changing. And uh, 
and evolving and, and that's what I like about it and it's about what's in front of you and what's not behind you so there might be 60,000 there might be 500 people behind you but it's what's in front of you that team that we love and the adrenaline of, of the games and the winning which keep us going yeah you've spoke about the ups and downs of managerial life, coaching life. One manager who's certainly having a little bit of a dip at the moment and you can see it visibly on him is Antonio Conte. What do you yeah. make of that situation at Chelsea at the moment? Well, it's the cycle of Chelsea, isn't it? It's um, bringing a manager all the excitement in. Uh, uh, they win the league, they win a double. Uh, the second season is a nightmare for whatever reason. Uh, that might be the coach, uh, and that might be um, you know the board behind. That might be the way that Chelsea is run. Uh, but I think as a Chelsea, as you go in, you, know, you have a year of success, and maybe the coach gets a lot of power, and 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 wants to start dictating a little bit more into in terms of the future and going off what the club wants. And um, you know, I think Conte has suffered from this. I think um, you know. They're self-destructing. That's what I think at the present moment. Um, you know, and that was from the start of the season. Costa was was the talisman for, for Chelsea last season. He was the main reason for me. Uh, he was the leader, uh, the focal point of everything. To lose him in the manner that they did, not quietly. Um, it was a saga that ran on and on. And Ruiz is in and out of the team. He was a mainstay last season. So... He's kind of lost two players there, and one player who was massive for And Matic, let's not forget that. as well. Sorry? And Matic as well, let's not forget. It was crucial with that partnership with Kante yeah, in the Conte, field. Yeah, that, it, it, it's crazy. I can't see that is a Conte decision. I can't, I just can't understand some of the decisions that are made at football clubs. But there again, you don't know until you're there, until you're behind the scenes that you know. But I, I definitely think because of that, Costa Ruiz... Matic going to Manchester United um, is not the, the the power, the control that Conte had last season. Once you lose control at a massive club like Chelsea, you can see it. You've seen it before and you're seeing it again. You've had to deal, Steve, with a lot of different types of chairman, chief executives. Steve Gibson at Middlesbrough, by all accounts, is as solid as they come. You've obviously had Mike Ashley at Newcastle, Mel Morris at, at Derby County. How difficult is it? And going back to the Conte one, you know, should he have known the path and the way it is at Chelsea? Or does he then, after that 12 months and of real success, think, well, I can start shifting things around there? But is it very much dependent on the hierarchy in terms of, you know, day to day? How difficult can that be? Uh, that's, that's one of the challenges and the main challenge now of, of managing. He's, he's not just you know dealing with the players, dealing with the media, dealing with the press, but managing upwards is absolutely key. And and that's why you've got to not so much do your homework, but go into a new situation, into a new club with your eyes open. Um, and the relationship, I always remember leaving Manchester United and, and asking Sir Alex for for advice. And he said to me, "Look, you know, don't go for the club, don't go for the you know the size of the stadium, the, the, whatever." He says, just go for the owner, go for the chairman, go for the one who's running things, deciding things, um, get a relationship with him. If you feel comfortable with him, um, then go with that, not anything else. And and that has been rule of thumb. And, and you've got to know, I went in with, with Steve Gibson, knowing that he would give you time, he gave me five years, he could have sat me two or three times easily within that period uh, but stuck with me and I've gone in with my eyes open in terms of you know Mel Morris at, at Derby and you know knowing that I was the seventh manager going in in what in 18 months the seventh manager going in I knew it was a volatile situation and you kind of know that so you know that uh, you know this could be uh, three months this could be three years this could be ten years um, it's that volatile so I think you've got to know You've got to have a relationship with the owner and the chairman. You've got to have an honest one, a truthful one, and and you've got to go ride the blows, go with the ups and downs, but be on the same page. Once you're off that page, once you're uh, fighting with the chairman, you're a dead man walking. And I've had that, uh, you know, quite a few times. And I've had it the other way where, 
my relationship and because of the relationship with the owner chairman I've been given time to get over the hump because you will get over the hump it's a little bit like I always say chairman owners everybody goes through a bad patch and, uh, and the sign of a good club successful club is that when you do go through that bad patch you stand by each other and you back each other and you see it all the way through until such time as you think for this isn't working but in quite a few instances now people are pulling the trigger far too quickly well one club Steve who certainly haven't pulled the trigger quickly uh, has been Arsenal now Arsene Wenger when he first came to England you would have been at Manchester United as the assistant manager you were I'm sure you would have come up against his teams down through the years very very impressive <clears throat> in his early years and had a reputation of of a, someone who would nurture talent now, I've been quite critical of, of Arsene Wenger in recent seasons in terms of I don't think he's interested in playing the game without the actual football sleeve. I think he's that obsessed with his own team, but they aren't as good as they were in that era, you know, when you would have been managed against them. So what, what, what's your take on Arsenal as the club now and Arsene Wenger in terms of where he stands right now in terms of his legacy with Arsenal? Wow. That's a good question and, and one in which um, I've, I've many friends who are Arsenal fans and, and I've always said to them when, uh, you know, uh, Arsenal must go, Arsenal must go, be careful what you wish for, be careful what you wish for. It's not easy managing a top, top club um, for what, 16, 18 years, however many he's done and been successful in the top four for that amount of time. Um, I can imagine, OK, he goes then Arsenal will, will honestly could, could really dip unless they get it right. It's got to be right on the field. It's got to be right off the field. And I think they're structuring the club in such a way, and Arsene Wenger has led it, and he's got total control of doing it. I hated, hated playing against Arsenal teams because on any given day, the way that they play football, I always said three or four years ago, if there were, I ever bought a season ticket in the Premier League, that season ticket would be at Arsenal because of the style of the football, the energy, uh, the way that they built on possession, uh, lost the ball, pressed, won the ball back quickly, uh, counter-attacked, could open teams up, go around you, through you, over you. They had everything. Early days, imagine they, they had such a, a rock-solid defence in which it was built from. I think that's the only thing that's missing with Arsenal and I can't understand why is that I would think my first job going into Arsenal would be to buy defenders to to make sure that... Sir Alex always used to say, last 10 games of the season, please, clean sheets. I want zero goals against because we'll always score. And that's what he wanted. And championships, winning, winning trophies are built on good defence, solid defence, on clean sheets. And Arsenal, over the recent years, that's my only one criticism, is that they never look like getting a clean sheet in every game. Would you, would, do you still think that applies, though, Steve? Because I've played against them, and I'm with you in terms of feared going to the Emirates, feared going to, especially when it was Highbury, and yeah. the type of players that they have. But they were that good then. And, you know, this, I, I understand what you're saying in terms of they might take a step backwards to go forwards, but it's not like when Sir Alex left Man United, I don't think, um, in terms of, you know, the, be careful what you wish for. I just feel with, with Arsene, and I'm with you that in terms of friends that are Arsenal fans, they, they really have turning out. And I find it sad because he has changed that football club drastically in terms of the style of play. Um, but I just, they frustrate me. They're probably one of the teams that frustrate me the most because I do think they are capable of a move more but I do think in this particular window we've seen a little bit of a power shift in terms of the signings you know yeah. Bami Yang uh, Mkhitaryan yeah. in terms of age profile they're yeah. not Wenger type signings are they really? No and I, and I think I don't know what I mean I, I know Arsene I've met him quite a few times over the last few years on on, uh, on, on courses and we, we've had days with um, uh, with the leaders who are, who are a group that get together every so often during the year and very, very intelligent, great philosophy on the game. Um, you know, a real professor 
as he was when he first entered. And and it's like we all have to do, Keith, and, and, and you'll have to do it going from a player to a pundit. You want to go into coaching. You, want to, you have to change and you have to adapt. Now, have, have Arsenal, has Arsenal, has the club adapted to to the modern game? Have people overtaken? Because if you stand still in football, you know you go backwards 10 steps. You've got to keep going forward. You've got to keep adapting. You've got to keep looking at new ideas, new things, and looking at different things. And, you know, and I think that's one of the reasons why, you know, Sir Alex certainly uh, retired when he did, um, because he felt the game was changing, and not in terms of on the field, but in terms of off the field, adapting to the salaries and, uh, and what's happening in the dress room because of salaries. And Arsene Wenger has to adapt to that, and Arsenal have to adapt to that. But you're absolutely right. I think, I think you know, this window we've seen a shift in terms of what's happened. Ozil re-signing, I think, has been a big shift, as you say, with the signing. And I hope in the summer that, that they go on, because, I, I, you know, I love Arsenal. I hate, I hate them and I love them. <laughs> no, no, I hate no. playing against them. You know it. You can, you can be run ragged for 90 minutes and lose five or six easily. And I love them, but I do think they need to get the recruitment right. I do think they need to get uh, the defence right, because that's the platform of every team. Hey Steve, it's uh, Owen here. I, w I wanted to ask you uh, about uh, Gareth Southgate. Of course, you know him very well, and you know the job that he's in very well as well. So when it comes to this summer, when it comes to the World Cup, just how much scrutiny will be on Gareth Southgate in terms of a media perspective, and how well capable is he of handling that pressure? Um, that we won't know until until the summer. Um, limited uh, management experience at Middlesbrough coming from playing. Um, it was excellent. I was on the on the on the pro license um, two weeks ago, uh, just observing and joining in. Really, uh, just seeing what the modern pro license was like and getting to know some young uh, coaches in the country. And Gareth gave uh, an excellent talk about his career, about his, his start, and uh, how he wasn't prepared for what happened, how being in the 21s of, of England has has given him that experience, certainly international level, tournament level. And I think that's one advantage that Gareth has got um, over a manager coming out of, say, a club. He's used to the routine of players once every three or four months uh, organising tournaments. What he's not used to is the scrutiny of the media and that will be exposed in the summer and leading up to the World Cup and how he does because at the moment he's come in and, and, and kind of come in a little bit on the blind side and, and, and not gotten an easy ride with the media but has done very well, introduced young players, changed it a little bit uh, of this and that. Um, but... Everybody knows the true test of an England manager is at a tournament. And and I was three tournaments with Spen. I mean, you've been on one uh, as a player, Keith. It's, it's poor. Uh, I, I can't tell, you can't explain and you can't express how huge and how big a tournament that World Cup is. And I saw that with, uh, with Spen in England and the pressure. He handled it very well, was very calm. I think Gareth has got that temperament, but we won't know until it's tested. With the benefit of time, Steve, has your perception of your own role with England and your time in that job changed over the years? In terms of what? In terms of potentially the way you come out of uh, the England job, uh, I would imagine that it was obviously an incredibly hard time for you. I've, as the years have gone by, has your perception of that changed at all? Uh, do you think better about the, when you look back on things, I, I saw you quoted in the Times recently saying that uh, at least you reached the summit. It doesn't matter what happened at the summit, you climbed Everest. I know, and, and, and somebody, you know, when I, when I was moaning about the experience in the England job, someone pointed that out to me, um, and, and people have done that quite a bit, but... You know, I, yeah, people. I know maybe when I retire and sit down and I've got grandchildren on my knee, maybe I will look back and go, well, you know, um, that was that was a great time and a great opportunity and things like that. You know, I'm just disappointed that I got the opportunity and, and didn't stay uh, on the top of Everest, say, on the peak for that long. Uh, that was my 
one true regret. What has happened since has been tough, but I've got back on the bike. Um, I went abroad, and I think opportunities abroad have come to me because of the England job, and and therefore my my uh, development as a coach manager um, has been huge, absolutely massive by going abroad, by working in Holland, by working in Germany, even by working in uh, in Israel with the Spanish staff. Uh, my knowledge, uh, my understanding of the game, the way it's developing and changing uh, has grown phenomenally. So I would say that I've now grown from, you know, a uh, um, a coach, a foreign coach with an English mentality. And it's something which foreign coaches come into England, I think, I think maybe lack. Um, and definitely when I went to Holland or, or Germany, all I got, gave them was that English mentality of, of really how to win games. Steve, I, I've obviously lived in England for a long, long time, so I would have witnessed these expectancy levels of the national team, and it's, it, it beggars belief at times in terms of you know the criticism that's levelled. And I found it quite interesting lately when Paul Lambert got the uh, Stoke job there was huge surprise. There was obviously a lot of talk about our national manager, Martin O'Neill, getting the job. But when Paul yeah. Lambert got the job, everybody was very surprised. But I, I, I read a very good point that someone made. And it was basically, he's a better manager now than the one who was doing very, very well at Norwich a few years ago because of the experiences that he's been through. But it seems as if, in managerial circles, as soon as you've already spoke about Steve Gibson, in terms of he could have sacked you on two or three occasions, you picked the right chairman, you, you, it, the fit was very good. Surely now you're in a you're in a much better place because of the experience you've had with the national team, managing in Germany and Holland, experience in Israel. You're in a better place now than you were ten years ago. Absolutely, <laughs> you're not thinking ten years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and you're not in ten years ago. Um, I was flying by the seat of my pants ten years ago, and and here, there, and everywhere, and. And that's what experience brings you. I mean, what what I like to see. And you're absolutely right. I, I feel I'm a far better manager, a far better coach, uh, far better understanding of myself and the situation and what's required than than 10, 15 years ago. And and you know the the, the damning of English coaches and English coaches, British coaches, really not getting an opportunity to manage. I feel it's one of my whew, one of my things that that uh, the bugbear. Yeah, because, you know, we are good coaches. We are good coaches, uh, but we're not, we're not admired in, uh, in Europe. But I think our coaches have changed. And what I like to see is the likes of Moisey, uh, Sam Allardyce, Roy Hodgson, um, Pardew, Lambert. They're getting jobs. They're getting jobs now and showing... Um, especially in terms of Roy and Sam um, and, and Baju Moisey, that age and experience, you need that. You need that. And I realise that. And I, I know now that all I need to do is, is, to, is to get back in and make it a good fit with a good club and a good chairman, a good project. Then you succeed. If you get a bad fit, you don't succeed. And that's the key thing, or one of the big things that, that I've learnt and that... I certainly will be looking for the next time. Steve, just to finish, um, Kevin De Bruyne has come out in the last couple of weeks and he's speaking about winter breaks. As a manager who's experienced that on both sides of it in terms of when you've managed in Europe and they have the winter break in England, we obviously, it's we're well documented, we don't. Looking maybe towards the World Cup and the preservation of the top players, what's your thoughts on it? Is it, is it a, a sensible option or are we just too bogged down with, with the whole tradition in England? It's a must. Number one, it's a must. Uh, I experienced it in uh, in Holland. I experienced it in uh, in Germany. Even in Israel, we had a we had a three week uh, a three week reseeding break. It's absolutely imperative because um, God, it was such a relief. It gave me so much. You divided the, the season into two halves. Your team. Um, could easily change in the second half of your mentality, the rest that you get uh, going back into training camp, it's like two seasons and you're refreshed and the players are refreshed and you're ready to go again but I think the key thing for for national teams and for England especially 
I've done three three tournaments with uh, Sven. We didn't know what to do with the players at the end of the season. They looked absolutely dead on their feet. If you kept them going, they'd die. Um, if you gave them a break at the end of the season, it was difficult to get them back to the levels again. Did you give them a little mini pre-season? Did you need to... It was so difficult. And we found that we were okay at the start of the tournament, but come the uh, the, the last 16, the quarterfinals, we were dead on our feet. And I remember it well in, in, in Japan 2002 against Brazil. Fantastic first half. We came in at halftime. I swear, I'd never seen the players were white, white, exhausted, gone. We were one nil up, and I thought, oh, we just need to hang on. Fatigue made us, made us go down to 10 men, and in the end, lost 2 1. And every tournament since, the players have looked leggy, tired, and mentally. I think the key thing is mentally, because our top players are playing Champions League till the end. Mentally, it's very difficult to get up for a major, major tournament after a long slog of a season. Steve, really, really appreciate you taking the time and good luck in uh, your next fetch. I look forward to seeing you dug out very soon. And you. Cheers, Keith. Thank yeah, you. Mate. Steve is an absolute gentleman. Nice to speak to him. Joining me in the studio now, though, is Ger O'Brien, Director of Coaching at St. Pat's. Thanks for coming in. No problem. It's been a busy day today. Yeah, another busy day, yeah. Just getting into the swing of things. You've had a good pre-season. I've been speaking to you a little bit um, behind the scenes. So, pre-season's gone well. Last season, I think, probably a little bit of frustration uh, for all concerned, but I think you're quite happy with so far how pre-season's gone, aren't you? Yeah, it's probably been, um, it's probably been a little bit uncertain pre-season because you can't, you couldn't plan, you know, early because we, towards the end of the season there was still that chance of us being relegated and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So we've kind of had to hit the ground running straight away, where others were already signing back players and stuff like that. But you know, I think we'd be relatively pleased with where we are. We've got um, a little bit of a tighter group. Mm. but more experienced group as well and we've signed some really good players in terms of like you, you speak about that and every year and it, it baffles me now when it, it kind of players on the 10-month contracts you, you see in England obviously players are getting two three four year deals how frustrating and how hard is that for the role you're in now obviously you work very closely with Liam and the, the hierarchy at, at St. Pat's in terms of trying to attract the players in and then 10 months down the line you're kind of back to square one again, trying to re-sign, trying to scout different types and, and trying to mould it all together in the space of, what, a six-week pre-season? Yeah, it is tough. It's been the way and it's been the norm, but I do think there is teams starting to try and change that mentality. Um, you know, Cork announced 52 weeks and it would have got a lot of exposure and it shouldn't really get exposure because it should be just the norm in any industry. It's a job, it's a full-time job. Um, but it shouldn't stop after a certain amount of time. I think clubs have been very clever and have held the power, but now we're seeing the flip on that. flip side is that Dundalk have lost some very, very good players for nothing. They've got no transfers e phase in for Andy Boyle, Daryl Horgan, Richie Towell, mm -hmm. probably three of the, the, the standout performers over the last five, six years in the league because they haven't protected you know, their assets. Their assets. Mm -hmm. And now I think what what we're finding, what we're trying to do is, and what we've, we're speaking to the owner about is these these kids coming through. We need to now start, you know, giving them an incentive to want to stay longer. So we've got education, you've got small contracts, stuff like that, where the clubs then can say, right, well now we have that power. We want the word that we have the power over these players now that we need to make it a full time environment. So it's up to us and the clubs now to be able to offer that. Mm. So. When the season finishes at the end of October or the first week of November, if you're lucky enough to get to a cup final, you, you're not back. You know, it's a long off season. So <clears throat> we want to say, right, okay, take your three weeks holiday, four weeks holiday, see you at the start of December. We'll get the we'll get the planning already at the end. But if you don't have them guys on fifty two week contracts, mm -hmm. who in their right mind is gonna come in when they could be off working for the Christmas period or something else? So mm -hmm. on that, yeah, it is a little bit frustrating. You've known Liam a long, long time. He was your manager at Sport and Fingal, um, re signed your Pats then as well. You've obviously got a good relationship with him. Was the coaching always at the back of your mind when you were playing in terms of that's what I want to do long term? And obviously, a Pat, Pat's a club that's very close to your heart. It's, it's, it was the ideal place for you to to get into, wasn't it? Yeah, I think the, the coaching side of things, um, I'd always have an interest in it. 
even when even my dad coaching the local schoolboy team, I'd always go down and, and do sessions and stuff like that. But would have took it a lot more serious then when I knew myself that probably England or the UK was not going to be achievable. So I wanted to kind of re-educate myself. I was it was that or college, but I said oh, I actually have you know a good kind of it. It, it was really kind of. It's hard to explain. If you either have it, or you don't. So, and I had that as I was playing, and I didn't want that to compromise my playing because I knew that the playing years are short, and um, I wanted to make sure that I, I was, I tried to be as successful as I possibly can without the interference of that. And then, probably around 2014, in the 2014, 2015, I started picking up niggly injuries. I had the uh, big problems with my groins, um, and the coaching kind of maybe, you, you know, became a little bit more important to mm. me then. I probably seen longevity in it, whereas playing, I probably knew I was coming to the end in the next two or three years, contracts wise, I knew that they were probably going to be a little bit lessened and stuff like that. And in League of Ireland terms, you know, that can be difficult. And then I kind of spotted a niche in the market. I knew that this r role was going to have to become part of the licensing of director of coaching, that, you know, you're going to have to have certain qualifications. And there was obviously going to be a 15s, a 13s, and stuff like that coming on board. So I had set my mind and spoke to the club on that. and. They were more than happy to back me, which which is lucky enough mm. for me. The, there has been a huge change. Um, you would have grown up in the exact same format that I, that I did, uh, schoolboy league all the way up. Um, I always make the point that the team I was in, there was a lot of us went to England. Now, as you well know, the percentage of players that go on and make it mm. are very, very slim. But I found back then that when players didn't, get that chance in England at 15, 16. They just fell out of love of football. Mm. So this is where I think, and I've got a huge passion for the National Leagues, 17s, 19s, in terms of the professionalism that it brings. I'm still to be convinced by 15s and 13s, but look, people would say I'd be sceptical anyway, but mm. I do think it's an important change. Um, so tell us a little bit about what you've seen at first hand over the last year or two. I do agree with you, and I think if you roll back to when when you were playing at 16, if you got the chance to go to England, great. If you didn't, it was almost like that yeah, was it. The world, wasn't you, it yeah. you were not going to make it as a footballer. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden we start seeing a trend with late developers, with the likes of Kevin Doyle going, Keith Fahey going, yeah. and people like that. And all of a sudden people are realising, hold on a minute, mm -hmm. you can maybe, still do maybe you can still do it here. And I think that was on maybe clubs in the UK also not buying into that rat race either and saying, well, if we can leave them at home, let the League of Ireland clubs, let them get exposed to maybe first team football over there. They're coming over. Mentally they're better. Physically they're better. Technically they're probably better as well. Mm -hmm. And the big thing about it is, is that we now have started to get our, our act together over here. You know, we, the Column and Cup was on this week yeah. up, up in, in Belfast and UCD, you know, the UCD obviously one that they've been doing it for probably a couple of decades now, but we have a very strong relationship at Pats with, with Minute University. And we've got kids now that when we speak to them, we say, listen, with our mum and dads, we say, where do you want to go? The kids always say England. The mum and dads say, love them to stay in an education side of things. So we say to them, great, listen, this is the plan we have now at Pats, that you can stay, play football, train, come in every day, work like and feel like you're a professional. Mm. But on the other hand, still come out with a degree at 21, yeah. 22. Yeah. And then you look at Conor O'Malley, who's only gone to Peterborough, mm. went... Uh, with a degree in his back pocket. Jake Carroll went to Huddersfield with a degree in his back pocket. So there is now proof to these parents and kids that 16 may not be the right time. Especially because, you know, I've worked with some of the underage players and I look at them, some of the lads that are at Pats, and I look at them and I think, you're staying, you're going down the path of the 17s, 19s, you've got Brian Martin involved with the first team now, uh, who's still only 17. They would have watched their teammates go across the water and I could see it in them when they meet back up on the international mm. street. I can see the the envy with some of them because they want it. Yeah. But there's arguments to be made that Ryan Mara at St. Pat's, Aaron Bulger at Shamrock Rovers getting first team action. They're getting a better football league education, never mind their actual mm. education, than some of the lads at West Brom, West Ham, Man City. Yeah, and I think we've all seen it first hand as well. The kids that come home, they're coming home broke. Yeah. You know, me yeah. mentally they're fragile, they feel like they're failures and they used to be, and I've, I've been at them, there used to be this thing, ah, oh, such and such is going away at 16, he's having a party. Yeah. We're celebrating going away, yeah, like I he's know. done nothing, you know what I mean? And to think back now on that, it was it was quite strange why we we done that. And 
N now these kids are starting to realise that, yeah, I can actually get it. And, but that's up to us in the clubs. We need to demand a professional environment. We need to make sure that their conditioning is spot on, that their food is spot on, that their training habits are good, that they come in, that they feel like they're footballers. And for us to give that to them, it's important then that the club, the hierarchy of the club buys into that because we can't look at it as a drain on resources. We need to look at it as that we're not preparing these kids to go to England, we're preparing them to come into your first team. Mm. And we're, we're, we're doing the best that we physically can with what we have on offer to do that. But the yeah. opportunities are greater than ever though, aren't they? In terms yeah. of this new structure, like we said, I'm, I'm still to be convinced with the tour teams and the 15s, yeah. but I may well change my mind. And that's because I would be listening to schoolboy clubs which will yeah. obviously have their side of us. Yeah. You've linked up with Crummel, Belvo and Cherry Orchard. Yeah. So how does that work with them? So they they nurture a talent from the age of four, five, six years of age mm. and then in this new structure they come to you for the under tour things which will launch next yeah. next January. How does that work then if that kid then goes to Manchester United at 16? Well, first of just going back to your point, I would agree with you on the tour teams. Yeah. I'm a little bit sceptical on that myself. Um, because I don't think we've betted in the 15s fully yet. Fully, yeah. Now we're only going into the first full 15 season. If we had to kick the back maybe another year with the tour teams, we would have gauged a full season yeah. before making a rash decision. Um, the other side of that is there's a lot of cost yeah. to it as well. In League of Ireland, as we all know, a lot of this stuff funnels to the first team. So we need to make sure that that's done properly. Mm -hmm. But how it would work is we would... We would um, if a kid, on the example that you've given, has been at Cherry Orchard coming at Belvedere since they're four, that's eight years by the time they're 12. There's a compensation agreement in place. We would compensate down. So we would say to them, instead of just that compensation years of 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, we actually want to compensate you guys for the work that you're doing yeah. already. So we have a figure on that, which is agreed with the clubs, to show them that we're not just taking the players. Mm. Already now you're going to get something if that kid goes away for the work that you've done. Then we've also extended the compensation agreement up as well, so it's a four to four years up as well. So altogether, from four to 20 basically, is where these clubs are getting some money back. Um, because it is a big deal, especially to the top schoolboy clubs. They would have you know, been under pressure to get kids away each year, each year, yeah. each year. So you know, it's important that we feel that we're not just taking everything, that there is a give, as well as the relationship with you know, coach education, CPD courses that we run yeah. for them. You know, uh, the emerging talent program that we set up that we'll be taking their players on a weekly basis with mm. Pat's coaches and stuff like that so because it is important Jay. you're, in, you're in a, obviously in a position now where you can influence that and yeah. we would have been in that position as 14, 15 year olds maybe going on trial there is a duty of care to that young lad and I think yeah. too, too often it's come down to financial reasons for that player to go across and you'll have yeah. seen it in the last few years certain players at Pat's they weren't ready mm. mature wise to be able to go across the water whereas yeah. You've got some that are going to go over in the next yeah. coming months, coming years, at that little bit elder age where they are more mature. They've got their they've got their education on their belt. They've got the leaving cert. Even in this January alone, we've seen nine players go from the League of Ireland over to the UK, and they're predominantly in and around 18, 19, 20 yeah. age groups. They should be able to deal with that transition yeah. in, a, in a more kind of seamless manner, shouldn't yeah. they? That's what we're hoping for. I think that's why it's important. When they can do it in their own environment here of, of still having mummy and daddy at home, cooking for them and stuff like that and cleaning and all they do is to worry about is coming in and training properly. Whereas they go away at 16 and all of a sudden they're thrown into a tough environment. There's, there's one kid who's in Sunderland that I'd be quite close with. I would, I would have coached him um, as a schoolboy in other clubs. And since he's gone over, he's had just had awful injuries. And even now, he got back playing, he's in the 23s and stuff like that. And again, last week, mm. a knee ligament injury, but you're probably going to put me out for another three months. And mentally now, is he better off there or is he better off here mm. in this country? Where, you know, he has his family and friends around him that can give him that support. It's a difficult one. Because um, there's no set answer, is there? No, and you even know, it's now, not like what's good for you no, isn't necessarily we, good for me. No, we have a kid now at the moment who's being offered a deal with a Premier League club. He's 16 years of age. He's due to go in June if all goes to plan. Mm. Everything's going to be agreed. Mum and dad are okay about him going, but the kid I know by him, he's having doubts, and this is from the kid. Normally, the kid is saying <coughs> yes, and it's mum yeah, and dad. So now, before he goes now, we need to make sure that he's 100%. Last thing I want is him mm. coming home next year feeling like I failed. So it might not be right for him at this moment in mm. time to go over. Got to talk about Wes Hulan, yeah. someone you've played against, I've played with and against with, not as much as I, yeah. I would have liked for obvious reasons. Um, 
he's had a magnificent career, isn't he? And again, he's one of those players that is a shining light to the lads coming through and knowing that there's even more spotlight now on the League of Ireland than probably ever in terms of mm. lads have gone around, gone over in the last few years, but he was probably one of the first, wasn't he? was, he? yeah, he was one of the first, definitely, and uh, what happened with Wes was that he probably needed those extra couple of years here. Was he ready physically? Probably not, and that's mm -hmm. why a lot of clubs overlook him. He would have looked at his size and yeah. stuff like that, but then he came and he said, well, hold on, he's dealing with the big boys here. And he went a long way in fairness. Wes yeah. has had to put in the graft to get where he, to get around the houses. And you know, I'm not sure what many caps did he get. 30, 30 others. No, he ended up getting 43, 43, 43, 43 which caps. Is still a magnificent yeah, tournament. Considering that he was capped so late, so late you yeah. know what I mean. And yeah. um, it, it, listen, it's it's such a pity because I know it would have been well documented by by other pundits, like you know, who wanted him yeah. in the team and stuff like that. But he just it just kind of he fell at a time where the, I think the national team was in a big transition period mm. as well we had maybe a couple of poor campaigns and then all of a sudden we were getting a little bit of success and we were doing it in a certain way and it wasn't really that mm. Wes way if you know what I mean like of getting the ball down finding yeah. the space and stuff like that and I know Joe was the one launching it <laughs> <laughs> you were chasing head there yeah. but no other man and again we've got to rethink re re back if Martin O'Neill or you know whatever Giovanni Trapattoni was a uh, club manager, they'd mm. probably pick Wes every week. Yeah. But international football is different. different you yeah. don't get a second bite yeah, of that cherry. And yeah. but listen, he'll be remembered as a top player. Yeah, and, very, you know. very fondly. We've had a couple of comments in. Jason and Sarah Keith, can have we anyone coming through to play that role Wes played for us? Um, Jack Kelly, uh, Jack, sorry, Jack Bourne. Jack Bourne, Liam Kelly being mentioned. Yeah. Two very talented players. Liam Kelly a little bit different for me. Jack Bourne certainly an out and out number ten. Yeah. Um, but as I've said all along, it's what they do at club level will mm. determine the opportunities that they get. So Jack Bourne now will have to reinvent himself at a lower level to yeah. bounce back. But he certainly got got age on his on his mm. side. Um, don't look at it like Wes only won forty three caps. I always remember his craft and skill and favourite moment has to be his goal against Sweden at the Euros. Thanks a million, Wes. So look, he's very fondly. Um, thought of and, yeah. and, and rightly so so look that's always the time right Jay thanks for no joining problem, us this. really appreciate you coming in um, join us next week you can download it on the, uh, off the ball website we'll be back next week at half past twelve